Okay, Thanks. well, um, I'm Coach Kibbs. I'm the women's lacrosse coach here at Linfield. And um, let's just go around, I guess, just introduce yourself and then we'll get started. Natalie? Yeah. Hey, everybody. I'm Natalie Welch. I am the um, faculty athletic representative and I also am a, a professor in the now new school of business and uh, focusing on sport management. And I'm originally from uh, the Cherokee Reservation in North Carolina. And so it's a big part of what makes me who I am. But yeah, I'll pass it off to Doug. He's next on my screen. Thanks, Nat. Coach uh, Hire. <laughs> Doug Hire, Senior Associate Athletic Director. Uh, this is my 21st year now at Linfield, also Linfield alum. And I grew up in uh, Pearl City, Hawaii. My mom is from Samoa, my dad's from Missouri. Pass it on to John. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Coach John Willis, uh, assistant coach men's basketball. I am from beautiful Jacksonville, Florida. And um, I just finished my second season at Linfield. So glad to be here. All right, Dr. Davis. I'm Miles Davis, actually in four more days. I'll be starting my third year at Linfield. And uh, I'm happy that you're here having these conversations, They're important conversations. So thank you for inviting me. All right. So um, Coach Willis, where do you want to get started today? Um, yeah, what about Jane? We're going to get Jane introduced. I'll just say I'm... <laughs> I'll just say a quick thing. I'm Jane and I'm an associate AD and I'm, I'm in and out of this conversation. If I don't hear the whole thing, I'm gonna um, listen to the recording, but uh, I'm currently working at community yard sale. So. <laughs> nice. Yes. So Wear I will your mask. I can. What'd you say? Wear your mask. <laughs> oh, I, got, I got my mask right here. I'm ready. And my hand sanitizer. I'm very excited for this conversation today. Thanks everyone for being here. All right, uh, so the topic today being systemic, um, looking more into the systemic issues of our society. Uh, Coach Willis? Okay, so that was the part, of the, uh, the part of the conversation that I was told to research upon. So I think that the best way to describe it or explain it rather is I have to give you like a timeline. Okay, so you can see the uh, the continued oppression of a group of people. Specifically in this context, we're talking Black people um, and other minorities, but specifically Black people. So if we go back to Reconstruction, which is the time uh, right after this American Revolution, so this is post, um, right after the American Revolution, the birth of our country, uh, you get the Black codes. And in the Black Codes, what those were, those were a set of laws that were passed to discourage free Black people from living in certain states uh, like Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, from bearing arms, from voting, from gathering in places to worship. So these were the Black Codes. So if you did these things as Black people, then you were in violation of the law. So therefore, arrested. So that goes all the way back to like the 1770s, okay? So as you move forward, um, and I can't go through everything, so I'm going to mention the names of some things for people to look up. Uh, you can look up uh, right after, right after, um, right after Reconstruction, we get the Louisiana Purchase which is in 1803, and that is significant because it doubled the size of our country, okay? Now, with that happening, if we flash forward about 60 years after that, we get the Homestead Act, and the Homestead Act gave 160-acre lots of land to any person who would lay claim for them for five years. Now we're moving into westward expansion. This is significant because 
1857, there's a gentleman by the name of Dred Scott. And Dred Scott sued for his freedom. And he was ruled against, the Supreme Court ruled against him, stating, now, now mind you, Dred Scott lived in Illinois and Wisconsin, which were free states that had laws against slavery. But the Supreme Court ruled against him in 1857, stating, and I quote, The United States Supreme Court ruled that he nor anyone of African ancestry could claim citizenship in the United States. So therefore, he wasn't even able to sue or follow the legal process in America because no one of African ancestry could claim to be a citizen. And this is in 1857. So as we're moving throughout our country's history, okay, we keep seeing over and over and over again how hurdles, systems, rules, laws, things are put in place to continue the oppression of Black people. So when somebody says, well, why are people upset about systemic racism or what is systemic racism? That is it, exactly. It is 1896, the Plessy versus Ferguson case, which gave us, which gives us separate but equal, um, which legalized segregation. I, I, and I don't, and I hope you guys understand that there was a time where Lindsay, you and I could not have drank from the same water fountain. There would have been a fountain labeled colored and a, and a fountain labeled white only. And growing up in the South, we have museums that show there's one pipe and the pipe has a valve on it that's triggered by your foot. So if I'm drinking water and you come up and drink water, you put your foot on the valve, Lindsay, it will cut off on my side and the water will go to your side of the fountain. As, as crazy as that may sound because we're drinking the same water, right? But the segregation was legalized, which gave us the Jim Crow, uh, the Jim Crow South. So again, it is years and years of the same old thing. It would be, it would be like, because a lot of us are athletes, right? A lot of people are coaches in this call. A lot of athletes are, are in this call. Again, it would be like if we're playing football and you're starting, it's 11 on 11. Well, you get to play with three people and you get to start at first and 50 and the other team gets to start at first and 10 every time. And well, they have four downs and you only get two downs, right? You understand what I'm saying? So it's, it's consistent. It is it is over and over and over again. Now, if you flash forward to today, okay, well, now if you look at just last week, we had all these polling places closed in Kentucky, and they were closed in, Af in predominantly African-American communities. So, again, how can you go vote if they're closing the precincts down where you live? So what are you supposed to do, take public transportation? Are there even buses that go to the areas where – the polls are open because in my hometown of Jacksonville, Florida, public transportation doesn't go to every neighborhood. It doesn't. So that is what is meant by uh, systemic or systematic or systemic racism. And if anyone would like to talk more about that outside of this call, please feel free to give me a shout. I will gladly put my cell phone number in the text uh, in the chat box. Um, but that is where the conversation is to start for today. Yeah, and I also wanted to say, if anyone has any questions, everyone's been muted, but feel free to type it into the chat box and um, I'd be happy to um, dish out the questions that way as well. I learned a lot recently. I um, was digging into more of the housing and um, what's called like redlining and how when uh, cities and towns are being developed, they were um, basically only allowing African-American people to live in certain areas, which were deemed um, not as uh, kind of, not as the nicer areas and neighborhoods. And like John said, they weren't 
you know, didn't have access to public transportation. Um, they were kind of cut off from access to like major, major roadways. And um, we often hear the kind of phrase wrong side of the tracks because uh, it's, it, you know, the train tracks and uh, railroads and that kind of thing were divided these communities. And um, this was done to really just keep and how it also leads to schooling systems and how your kids are sent to school in a certain area and um, the higher taxes that are paid by community um, go to the school system and so the, the well-off uh, communities have better schools and those uh, without um, continue to go without and it's really um, just really upsetting uncovering all these things that like these are policies and law and the book um, I've been reading a lot recently is how to be anti-racist and the author um, Ibram Kendi talks about how every policy is racist in some way it's not neutral it's intent it's not maybe not intentionally but it's in some way including or excluding people and that really opened my eyes and um, as a Native American, I've always just grown up with family and people who are like, well, you know, you don't, you don't touch the government. You don't trust policies. We had what was called treaties where we were uh, promised things that weren't upheld. And so when John talks about these things uh, like Louisiana Purchase and westward expansion, like these things that, um, again, were all based on um, really betraying a whole group of people. And so um, it's sadly in our history. Um, and the more you uncover, it's just kind of really, uh, really alarming. And um, something else I heard in a webinar this week um, was that like there, there's no neutrality in oppression. Um, it is a, very much a verb and it's something that is actively being done to people. And so, um, we may think that we're sitting back and, um, you know, even if you think you're not contributing in some way, you most likely your inaction is contrib in a, a contribution in and of itself. So um, it just makes me think a lot harder about how am I kind of playing into these systems. Um, I live in a our, our, our house here in Knoxville before I moved out to uh, Linfield. It's very much in one of those suburbs. It's like a nice school area. And um, it's like, wow, I, it kind of just, it really, really opened my eyes. And I think um, we grew up taking a lot of things for granted. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember too that systemic racism doesn't define like you personally as a bad person or um, that's not anti-racist. It's understanding like the history of it and where it comes from and like how it was actually formed to lead us to where we are today. Cause I think some of us, me included, can be really naive and wear this kind of veil of just like ignorance of not understanding like the actual history and understanding like the origin of how it is, like the system is racist. And not understanding that and not trying to understand that I think would be kind of one of those complicit situations, right? But if you want to um, take action and be anti-racist, that, that's where you're really trying to gain knowledge into, uh, you know, what is systemic racism. I would also add that um, I know that I was talking about a lot um, and they were historical things, but I would challenge you all to look at Things like Nat was talking about, like redlining. I'd also challenge you to look at gerrymandering. Um, I'd also challenge you to look at the budget from your hometown. So one thing I did yesterday was I looked at the school budget in my hometown, and I looked at the, um, the parks and recreation budget, which uh, is underneath public works. And then I looked at the police budget. So in my hometown of Jacksonville, Florida, this past year, the police budget was $200 million more than the school budget combined with the public works budget. So my point in that is, if knowledge is power, then why aren't we spending more on educating than we are on law enforcement? I don't understand that. 
Um, the, the whole idea of systemic racism is very deep and is very woven into our country. Um, you see it even down to the way that you see charges uh, printed like in your newspaper, right? So, so there's, there's just so much to that. So I would, I would caution you like that's like a buffet of information. Okay, that's like a buffet of information and it, it'll really start to make you question and look at things around you. And then I also want to make sure that people know that I'm just not just some angry black guy because I'm really not. Um, I, I don't want revenge. I'm not seeking revenge. I don't think Nat is seeking revenge, but, but I do want equality. I do want equality. So like in our textbook, and this is something I'm sharing personally, I taught history for seven years, I taught 12th grade. And there are several students that I've reached out to and apologized to. And there's a lawyer that I've contacted wondering, could we sue the book publishing company? Because I feel like I misguided these students. So, you know, I hear about the beauty of westward expansion, but the, the truth is what comes from that is the Indian Removal Act. And the fact that people who look like or Nat's ancestors are forced to walk from Florida to Oklahoma while people are chasing them, looking to kill them. Like that is, that is the reality of the situation. You know, so um, I would just challenge you guys to, to research more and more, and then you can kind of pay more attention to what's going on around you and understand that when people are like, oh, it's systemic racism, that's really not a fairy tale. That's not, that's real. That's, that's loans for your farm. That's like operating budgets to operate a farm, right? So like my in-laws are farmers. They have an operating budget, right? You need an operating budget so you can keep working the ground, paying the workers, getting pesticides that you can spray on stuff. So um, if you're not able to do that, right, then you'll, you'll lose the land. Yeah, John, okay. how, how much, like, had well, I'm just curious how you got into teaching history. Like how much, how and then how much of that? Like did you find? Like were you just like getting those textbooks and being like, what what's happening here? Like what was that like? Um. Well, okay. So I've always had a problem with Black History being Black History Month is the shortest month of the year, right? So I've always had a problem with that. And I actually got called to the principal's office once because I said I wasn't teaching anything out of the textbook during the month of February. Um, and I was like, well, if you'd like to learn something, my classroom door is never locked. You're more than welcome to come in. I said, but I'm not going to tell these students that slavery was this economic magical structure that would have just worked itself out. I'm not going to do that because that's not the truth. That's a lie. Um, so um, I got into teaching history because uh, I'm a big Duke Blue Devils fan, okay, uh, for men's basketball. I am. Um, and Duke was the first uh historically all white college to play a historically all black college uh they played north carolina central and they were both national champions and the game had to be played at 11 a.m on a sunday in the south because in the south at 11 a.m on a sunday that's the most segregated hour in the south because it's church time okay and everybody and everybody's in church at that time so while everybody was in church they played the game so because of that i decided i should teach history and I was a basketball coach. And so I, I didn't want to be like the stereotypical dumb jock. I wanted to show that I could teach a core subject. So that's how I got into it. Um, I was reading recently, I'll post the link, but there's a book called The Indigenous People's History of the United States. And in that introduction, they talk about how they reach out to these different book distributors about kind of the imagery they use and the kind of, uh, whitewashing and the kind Natalie, of I think you guys oh no amazing you're good for me so, Natalie okay you actually froze for me Kibbs um and just the the whitewashing that goes on um in the education system and now I've been following Oregon the state of Oregon uh Kenna pointed out in the chat that um it is different states get different editions of textbooks and then then you think about too the the, the, the different schools I'm sure depending on uh, the 
economic area are getting older editions versus newer editions and how much that's playing into that. Um, and it is, uh, it's just crazy to think about how we take, we just take for granted so much growing up, like where we're getting our information from. And um, we don't question, and we're not we're really taught to question it is I guess what's um, some uh, also I think really kind of alarming. And um, one thing I was reading about too is um, how one of the elements of white privilege, again, if you, um, if you're able to, um, again, I always like to stress that like when, when I say white privilege, I don't mean that um, being white has made, but your life hasn't been hard because you're white, but because you're white, that's not one of the reasons that your life has been hard or you've had challenges. It's all, it's most likely going to be uh, like beneficial to you. And one of the elements that uh, this author discussed was this ideal of um, being able, able to just to designate legitimate and illegitimate uh, lines of discussion and debate. So the fact that we're able to have this Zoom chat and like able to even talk about these things, whereas a lot of people um, with, you know, in, in white America, they say they don't even cross that line of having these conversations. Um, and that power they enact in not having those conversations continues to leave uh, the oppressed people at the margins kind of suffer for the, that, what, what she calls white silence and white fragility. And um, so I think Kibbs got kicked off. I'll get her back on here. Um, but uh, I'm, one, I'm curious, President Miles, you look like you're, you got some thoughts. I have a number. Uh, in particular, I was asked to address patriotism because of my time actually serving on active duty. But I actually want to go back into some of the issues you talked about because they're relevant to origin. Because I think sometimes when we talk about this, we discuss this within a context that discussed it away uh, from uh, what we're dealing with now. And so since we're at Linfield, I want to bring it back to Oregon and Linfield. And then I'll discuss patriotism a little bit. Uh, most people do not realize that Oregon was founded as a white utopia, uh, that in fact uh, it had laws that excluded uh, uh, Blacks and Native Americans from being in town after sundown, uh, which means that I could have never attended Linfield when it was founded. Uh, and it's important to keep that in mind. And as I fast forward and I look at the absence uh, of Black and Brown people among the faculty and among the staff, uh, and among the administration at Linfield, you have to ask yourself why. And so when we discuss the issues of racism, we discuss the issues of racism, uh, and I'm glad to hear you're talking about it from more of a structural perspective, because it is not about you being racist. There are unspoken things that are built into the system. And so if you start saying that you only want faculty from certain institutions, and those institutions have historical record of excluding certain people, thereby you don't have anybody in the pipeline to even come into your institution. And so you are overlooking the Howards of the world or the North Carolina A&Ts or the Florida A&Ms of the world or the Clark Atlanta Universities or the Morehouse Universities. And you're saying that you only want people from uh, Yale or Princeton or Harvard, then you're diminishing in and of itself, even though that's not being racist, it's promoting a structural inequality into the system that has to be addressed. Uh, if we if we truly seek to engage in diversity and equity, and then what happens once they come into those places? How are they treated? How are they respected? Are they disrespected? Are they are they put into the other? And then I'm not even dealing with the double duty. If you look at it from a faculty perspective, as a person who spent 18 years as one of the only few faculty members that look like me doing double duty because I had to speak to all issues related to black and brown people at my institution. And so then that has a structural component because then when you go up for those committees to look at promotion and tenure, they wanna know what your scholarship is, but they're not including your social duty and obligation. Natalie, I'm talking to you because there are things that you're doing which should be considered that are, are if they're not considered, continue to promote this attitude even at Linfield. And so I don't want us to think that this is something that's out there. It exists within the ecosystem in which we find ourselves in. And unless we change our thinking about that, 
we can't really talk about change. We're just giving lip service. We're just recounting history. We're just talking about what is happening. And those who have spent time with me know that I'm much more interested in what are we going to do about it than talking about it. I'm interested in how are we going to actively engage the system to show that we can be different, that we can improve things. Who are we promoting? Who are we hiring? Who are we bringing in? Who are we considering? Because that is more important than me constantly having to bear my wounds to you and talk about what happened to you about how are we going to change this. Uh, and then on the patriotism, it's unfortunate that we find ourselves in a time, uh, particularly with people, most people who are talking about patriotism have never been willing to put their butts on the line or have never served any time on active duty, have never been willing. Uh, all they want to do is give lip service uh, to what is going on. But, I, but patriotism is normally thought about as a love of country. Uh, and I want to expand that perspective of love. And I mentioned this perspective to you, not because I'm advocating you follow a particular theological framework, but I'm advocating a particular perspective of love that I read that strongly influences my thinking. Uh, and it's contained within a book that people refer to as the Bible. And that verse says, whom the, love, whom the Lord loves, he chastises. Whom he does not love, he leads to go astray. And so when I read that in the midst of my theological studies years ago, what I come to understand that love, i.e. patriotism, requires you to engage in critical analysis. And, you know, patriotism is not an unquestioning loyalty. In fact, the most loyal people engage in the questioning of the system because they want to know how it can do, how it can be better. Uh, and I am trying to internalize that in my life that just because somebody criticizes me doesn't make them an enemy of mine. Criticism is just criticism. In fact, they are often can be critical from a place of love because most of us seem to think that we're born perfect and can't uh, tolerate that anybody calls us out on anything that we do, and that's not my perspective. But the perspective is of, of, a, of a country is that we have to be willing to question our country. And so I, I don't know what you saw today in the news that Rhode Island is changing its name because most of us know the name Rhode Island, but the whole the name of the state is uh, the state of Rhode Island in plantations. And so they're taking off the plantations off the end of the name because they realize it refers to an error that is going by. And so the same thing we look at being patriotic to our country is that we have to be critical of what our country is doing. You know, I find it very interesting. There is a group, uh, uh, and, and again, I'm not trying to make a political statement because that's not where I live, but that has been co-opted by people whom we call conservatives or people whom we call Republicans, who if you go to their rallies uh, or if you watch their rallies, uh, you'll see them consistently waving the American flag. And as, as, as if that's the ownership of it, and somehow, and even today, you have the president occupant in the White House uh, calling Black Lives Matter treasonous because they dare question a system. And so those who get to, uh, those often wrap themselves around the symbolism uh, as a defense against those who would criticize the things that have happened. And I'm in the state of Virginia now, a better, better, excuse me, the Commonwealth of Virginia, because there's a difference. I'm in a con the Commonwealth of Virginia, where there used to be, and I haven't seen them since I've been here, there's a person that drives through uh, the town with a six by nine Confederate flag on the back of his F-150 pickup truck, who wrapped themselves in these symbols of patriotism without engaging in true patriotic endeavors. And patriotic endeavors requires us to call into question. But I will tell you, I, I am very much a patriot. I love this country with all its flaws with all its misapprehensions. I've been in over 70 countries around the world and, and the United States has its problems. But I will tell you, uh, particularly to the young people are on this, I see Kenna and, and I see uh, Paige and I see a few others that are on this call. Um, I will tell you to express your patriotism and the most patriotic thing that you can do is register and vote. I don't care how much money any campaign is spending. Uh, it doesn't matter because it is canceled out by one person, one vote. And I know that it's a pain in the butt to stand in line, but people died, and particularly for my right to do so. 
Uh, and if you're a woman, you weren't even given that franchise until 1920. And so, uh, and then there are those because it is, that is the chance to get your voice heard. We are not a democracy. We are a republic and the republic is a representative structure. And so unless people are hearing from you, you have waived your right. Uh, and I think that you should embrace your right to be a patriot uh, and fight for uh, what you believe to be the right thing. Uh, and that's a, that's a nonpartisan message. So I maintain a 5013B status and I can't deliver partisan messages, but uh, it lets you know that you need to go out and you have influence and impact upon our world. And I'll stop there for any questions that people may have. Thank you. Uh, uh, go ahead, Newman. That's okay. I was just gonna say, speaking of you know, taking action and um, rather than just sitting and talking and you know doing something. One thing that we talked about too is kind of creating maybe like a list of action steps. So whether that's uh, some way to show your patriotism of something other than wrapping yourself in a symbol of patriot patriotism, but um, you know even going back to the systemic racism, um, Natalie, uh, Miles, and Coach Willis, if there's something that you have in mind around like action steps for people, what would you suggest? Uh, I, I, I have actually three off the top of my head, and, and, and I, I guess because I spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff, and I, as I'm looking at the people who are in this, these calls, I'm actually going to direct those action steps for you. For those who are faculty on this call, uh, and I think that some of this is underway because I was in a great conversation with a faculty member the other day, look at the curriculum. Look at what's being taught and explore, engage, engage in a critical analysis, engage, engage us in the thinking about this and what's required to truly come out with a Linfield education. Uh, we have to do much more than just prepare people for work. We have to prepare people for life and prepare people to function in, uh, in this republic. Uh, as I look at the coaches, look at your practices on your team. Where are you recruiting? Where are you reaching out to? And then if you bring in uh, the other, and, and that's anybody who is not normally here, if you bring in the other, what are you doing to make sure they have a successful experience and eliminate all barriers uh, for conscious or unconscious bias? I can't believe the dickens of a time that we had trying to get a policy changed about haircuts. Not understand, and I understand that it's the Linfield program in the Linfield way, but you know, what do you say to Rastas? What do you say to a Sikh? What do you say to a Mori? You know, these people that were, or, or, or a person from an indigenous tribe whose ponytail means more to them than life itself. What are you saying to those people if you're saying, well, if you come here, you got to look like us? You know, you, 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 we got to stop that, you know, and particularly in sports. Sports is a place where you have the opportunity for absolute meritocracy. Who can run faster, who can jump higher, who can put the ball through a hoop. It shouldn't be an issue. It's a, it, it should be a true meritocracy. And in, in the students, in the students who are on this, find someone who is different than you, however you define you. Find someone that is different from you and get to know them. You know, and be willing to, to have conversations uh, uh, and engage. Uh, there are really only two places in the United States that we truly get a chance to interact with people that are different than us uh, because we're so separate in our lives. It's, and one is a college or university and the other is in the workplace. And so um, I will tell you that we have to get to the point where we treat each other um, uh, with respect. And so if you're straight, get to know somebody who's gay. If you're a Christian, get to know somebody who's an atheist. You know, if you're, if, if, you know, and it doesn't matter how few these people are, find out about what it is to be Samoan and Hawaiian island culture, because it is a different culture. It's a different culture. And so find somebody who's different from you and engage them in conversation, go to lunch. And, and, you know, uh, and, and be willing to listen and hear their perspective on things about what it is uh, that and why they see the world differently from you. And those are my three action plans and I'll stop there.
I also just want to echo. Oh, go ahead, John. I was just no, going to say, you know, with, with the race, people of mixed race, you know, people see you, they don't know who you are. But they have these assumptions of what you are by maybe the way you sound, how you dress, how you look. And uh, Dr. Miles knows this. I think it's important that we talk story, that you get to, like you said, to meet people and hear your story. And don't be afraid to approach people and say hi and, and engage. And once you hear people's stories, you're going to start to appreciate the cultures of where you're from and who you are. And I think we got to be able to talk and engage. And I think that is so healthy for all of us. People see me, big guy, oh, scary, you know, but most people who know me, um, pretty much a general giant is what it is, you know, so I love that. I love that concept. We got to talk story. Let's talk, engage, get to know each other. So, so powerful. I would add to that uh, as an action plan, I would, as an action item, um, I would encourage you to attend maybe a rally. Um, it, it, it may not be something that you see eye to eye with, but you can go and listen and observe. Um, and maybe you'll learn something um, and just gaining a different perspective. So I would encourage that. Um, I'd also question you to, or challenge you to say, what are you doing to work on your critical thinking skills every day? Because our society is not designed for you to think. It's not. It's designed for you to be controlled. Um, for example, cars are sold based on their ability to perform, how fast they go, but we have speed limits, right? So if 70 miles an hour is the fastest we can safely drive in a car, then why would they sell cars that go 200 miles per hour? Makes no sense. Well, it's because we're our society is designed for you to be controlled. So I would challenge you to think critically every day. Want something to work and build on that thinking aspect. Uh, I just I just want to echo uh, President Davis's um, call to vote because um, I'll be honest, I haven't voted my life. I, in any sort of federal, I've voted in my tribal elections, but I was always taught, like, we don't trust the government. It doesn't even, we don't matter. We weren't even allowed to vote. Native Americans weren't allowed to vote until 1968. Um, but now, I'm, as soon as I get back out to Oregon, I'm going to go get registered so I can finally vote. And it's so easy to make excuses like, oh, I'm moving, or I'm in college, or I'm in this, and I'm in that. And so I definitely encourage that. Another thing I encourage you to do, especially over July 4th, um, is look in there. I'll post the link, but um, look and see there's, it's called Whose Land Are You On? And it's basically the indigenous people who lived on the land uh, before um, colonization, before uh, westward expansion and all these things, because uh, it's, it's kind of amazing to see. And even um, in Oregon, all over Oregon, like these are all, everywhere, it's all native lands. And um, when John was talking about, you know, westward expansion, and um, it's crazy to think about. I just found out a couple years ago um, my great, great, great grandmother, um, the reason why my whole family's in North Carolina is because she ran off and hid in a cave when the removal of the Cherokee people happened from, um, North Carolina to, uh, Oklahoma. And because she hid in the mountains of <laughs> North Carolina, that's why my family's all there. And like, every time I think about that, I just, it just blows me away because like we could have been there's no telling where we were it would be um, if we would have made that journey and so just learning those little things and i i'll post the land thing but also um i, I discovered a, another kind of action thing we could do it's called ally to action um and it's kind of a online it's a 21 day um it says it takes 21 days to create a habit um, so it's going to be this daily program where you get a daily text or email kind of um, challenging you to th think critically because I, I agree 100% with John. We need to really make us think um, about that and um, I, I, more, it's so easy to just turn your brain off and look at Instagram or look at TikTok and, you know, you know stream Netflix. But um, I think we really have to have to push each other. Um, and 
uh, my last one would say just to, I know it may be hard for people to have conversations with their family. Um, I, I definitely, there's still things I, I struggle with that too, but just talk to someone, a, a friend, a cousin, an uncle, uh, uh, a neighbor, um, talk to someone about these issues. Cause I think the more that we talk, um, the more we can heal. And, um, yeah. Natalie, um, I think Kenna asked a good question that I'd be interested in hearing the, the coach's perspective about uh, diversity in sports. And I'll offer it just from, from my neighborhood. I grew up in inner city Philadelphia. Uh, there was no ice hockey. Uh, the race, race car is a moonshiner sport. Uh, and so a lot of things have cultural roots. But what there was in my neighborhood uh, was a basketball court. Uh, and so it is no, it is no coincidence, not, it's not genetic, because uh, basketball in this country with Nysmith started out as a Jewish game, uh, and then as it migrated into the YMCA, uh, but it was easy for those who lived because of, you know, because the Jewish community, as well as other ethnic groups, were concentrated in the small urban areas. And so thereby, there, there was limit, there weren't a bunch of fields, it wasn't, a, you know, uh, to play on, and then the black community picked that up as it moved into those communities, so it became uh, uh, part of the part of the issue. But uh, I, I would love to hear your thinking about, you know, uh, particularly since there's so many uh, coaches and uh, student athletes that are on this, and get the coaches' re responses to that that question that Kenna asked. Um, I feel like lacrosse sticks out like a sore thumb, right? Of just no diver like very very little diversity, and it is initially a Native American sport. And, you know, last year, wow, I didn't we, know that. Okay. we went to Central Oregon to Warm Springs Indian Reservation to teach their children, like, how to play lacrosse. So it's interesting. I want to know where, you know, at what point, you know, that kind of switch happened. But, and that's an <laughs> ongoing topic that we talk a lot about in, in lacrosse. And, um, you know, I think one of the barriers, too, is that socioeconomic barrier of just lacrosse equipment being expensive. I mean, you know, I think football also has expensive type of equipment, but there's a system where things get handed down, right? So that's one thought that's kind of Is everybody else losing Lindsay uh, also? And yeah, um, that happens. You know, Lindsay. how to... Uh, okay. Oh, maybe not. I'm back. So, uh, I'm in my office. I, don't, I shouldn't have any issues with my internet. <laughs> Try turning off your video, Lens. Um, right, we lost it totally. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, can you we hear got me? You. Yeah, we got you. Okay. Um, I don't know what the last thing you heard was, but just lacrosse in general, obviously, was a initially a Native American sport. Um, you know, I've tried to get our own team involved in the community, uh, whether that might be free clinics for kids, because that's one thing is it's used for some reason, lacrosse always wants to charge like a very high fee, right, even just for beginner kids. Um, so that's something I try to be conscious about. Um, you know, I said that earlier, I don't know if you heard me, but, you know, we went out to the Warm Springs Indian Reservation and taught those kids at that reservation um, about lacrosse and did a little beginner's clinic for them uh, with the team. And so those are just some ways I've found to be kind of like an action item for that. Um, yeah, it's a prep school sport in the Northeast for sure. Um, but, you know, I hope and I am from Kentucky originally, so lacrosse was a, definitely in a non-traditional area, and that's why I love coaching lacrosse in Oregon, too, another kind of non-traditional area. But, you know, as the sport continues to grow, I hope to, you know, hopefully take away those socioeconomic barriers, um, always looking for suggestions, too. Um, I'll speak to it from, a, from an African-American standpoint. Um, Right or wrong, right or wrong, we 
tend to idol, idolize or, um, or pro sport athletes become heroes for black kids. Um, probably around about the third or fourth grade. Okay. Uh, so the, the, the pros that we see are usually football or basketball player. Uh, sometimes they're track athletes. We don't see a ton of, um, a ton of black soccer players that are our heroes. Um, you know, it's like I grew up in an era where anytime I would throw a piece of paper in a trash can in high school, I'd yell Kobe, right? Like I was shooting it, like I was Kobe Bryant, um, you know, all the way down to the shoes that you wear or the number that you may wear when you're participating in the sport. Now, growing up, I think that my Pop Warner Association probably has some of the fastest kids in the city, but we didn't have a soccer team. We had nobody who could, who could come and teach us how to play soccer. So all I grew up playing was baseball, basketball, and football. That was it. That was all that was offered at my park. So I can even remember going to middle school. And now, now some of you guys may laugh if you're a baseball guy, but the first time I saw a curveball, I was in the eighth grade. It was the first time I saw a curveball from the batter's box. So I thought I was about to get hit by the pitch and I jumped out the box and they're like, strike. And I'm, I'm looking crazy. Like, what do you mean strike? Like the ball's about to hit me. So I'm just saying, I think that they're, I think that that would be the reason why, you know, we as black people, you know, we have to get beyond this hurdle of, okay, you can do more than play basketball or play football. Like you can be an artist, you know, you can be, um, you can be a music artist or there are just so many other things that are not celebrated in our African-American community. And a lot of people are looking at sports as a way to a better life. You know, for example, I worked at a high school called Reigns High School. And at that school, you know, we, we had kids who, we had kids who would have on, you know, a $200 pair of Air Jordans, right? But not, you know, but you couldn't get them to, to spend money on SAT or ACT preparation. You know, so because the parents are looking at it as, okay, I'm going to do all I can for this sport because the sport is our way out. It's our ticket out of the hood. That is the phrase that is used a lot. So um, I think there needs to be access to other sports. Um, and then I think there needs to be um, more of a perspective change to, to, so that the people who live in those communities can know and understand that, yes, you could be successful in life, but it's not necessarily through dribbling a basketball. Like a, a lot of black guys struggle with the day that they realize they're not going to the NBA or the day that they realize that they're not going to the NFL because a lot of black kids don't have another plan because that's all they've known. Yeah, I, I would challenge all of our all of our coaches to really think about how they recruit and where they recruit and I was watching a really great, it was the 48th anniversary of Title IX this week, and um, I was watching a really great uh, panel, and Dawn Staley was on there, and they were talking about, you know, African-American women and their access to sport, and she said, growing up, I think it was something like 2.2% of lacrosse players are African-American at the, at the high school level, and I think she said she didn't even know what lacrosse was in high school, and I think that, again, proves the point that, like, just the access and the opportunity is a big issue. And um, I think a lot now too, with what's going on in society of this idea that like, like, you have to go all in on one sport and you have to specialize in one sport and that's going to be your best way to get into college. And then I hear over and over again, athletes and coaches talk about how great it is when kids play different sports and they learn different skills. Um, but over and over again, what I've been hearing is like rethinking how, we recruit because, um, you know, you may go to the top tournaments or the top, you know, top AAU tournaments or the top club tournaments or the top um, division high schools. But like, what about the talent? There's talent at the other levels. It's not just 
um, the kids that have the money to pay for those things. Um, and that becomes such a big barrier to entry. I was blown away when I worked at Disney and how teams would come down from the Northwest to do their spring training for baseball and softball. And I was just like, how do these people have the money to afford to go to Florida and like do that? And like, I, it, the, so things like that, I think, um, sadly it's, you know, a lot of it is that socioeconomic of having a chance to just play and then having a chance to get seen and get an opportunity at the next level. And so I think it'll be um, really interesting um, how we can move forward and being intentional about, um, you know, making sure we're recruiting a diverse um, population, not only diverse in the sense of race and ethnicity, and, but also in the terms of socioeconomic background and where they're, where they're coming from. Uh, I, and I also, I, I, I think what happened and like, I think there's still very much I have, there's a love hate with sports sometimes because a lot of people think sport is like the cure all and like, oh, it brings people together and it gets rid of all these barriers. Um, but I think sometimes sports like hockey and race car driving, they really try to um, say that like, oh no, I mean, everyone's equal on the field, right? But um, I've really been following what's been going on with Bubba Wallace and NASCAR this past couple of weeks and how, um, you know, the story became quickly about a noose in his garage and then people were questioning if he was doing it for attention and um, if it was a setup. And um, people forgot that that same day after, you know, Confederate, they NASCAR banned the Confederate flag, again, another symbol of this kind of culture, um, they were flying Confederate flags over the racetrack because they, that was a, a loophole. They could fly a plane with a Confederate flag over the racetrack um, and avoid, you know, that's, you know, they're not at the track, so they're above it. And um, so people weren't talking about that. They were talking about um, this um, incident with Bubba Wallace, which I think Bubba Wallace deserves all the attention in the world, but I think it lets people ignore the deeper cultural things that are going on there that you can ban the confederate flag but that's not gonna automatically flip and switch change everything and make it it's all not all gonna be good right it's um not automatically gonna fix everything but i think it's i've been proud to see and a lot of people have said nascar's done in this past week or so more than nfl has done in like 20 years so they're they're at least doing something so I think um, I have to applaud them for doing doing those things. But again, we have to, again, think, figure, why is there only one African-American NASCAR driver? What can we do about that? You know, that's a very interesting topic, Nat. Um, you're talking about pro sports. Um, traditionally, African-American athletes, as far as the pro level goes, there's more of a presence in the NFL and the NBA, right? And so, in the NFL, if you look at like contracts and pay structures, like traditionally you have white guys who are quarterbacks who tend to make way more money than let's say black people who are running backs, right? And so like in this past season, just in this past season alone, and this case was this this case was interesting to me because this kid was a former student of mine. There's a guy named Derrick Henry. Right. I, I know, you know, Derrick Henry from Alabama, probably he probably broke your heart at Tennessee, but but he led the NFL in rushing this year. This year, he led the NFL in rushing. If you Google him, he even had a 99 yard touchdown run uh, versus the Jaguars. And I mean, he just was outstanding this season. However, the quarterback uh, Tannehill got a new contract this year from the Titans. And Derrick Henry did not. So, again, it just goes to show, like, how the systems that are in place, you know, it, it speaks to, like, what Dr. Davis was saying about not necessarily being racist, but then the systems that are, that are in place. So um, I would also, to speak to, to Kenneth's question, I think about, like, when you're talking about recruiting, uh, I don't know if you've like, seen a video that Alabama released yesterday or not. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you should check I was just that talking, out. I was just talking to my, to my friend about it. Yep. I think you should really check that video. out. But it's it's 
it's interesting to me because now we do know this as black people, um, there's this perception that it's a better experience if you go to a traditionally white institution, if you go to one of these power five institutions. So for example, if you are uh, a highly you know, ranked football player, well, it's an honor for you to go to Alabama or to Tennessee versus going to like um, Florida A&M or, or to Doom Cookman or Grambling, right? Or to Grambling, which is something that is really, I'm in a, uh, another group of, of black coaches where the silence from power five coaches on the issues that are going on in our country right now, people are saying, how can you as a coach come into a black family's living room and say, I care about your kid, but then they've been silent on all of these issues. You know, so there's, a, there's this idea that, okay, you're coming and you're picking the best athlete out of this community, but what are you putting back into this community? And most of the time that's nothing. You know, so um, I, think, uh, I think that is another layer um, to, to the problem. Yeah. And uh, I love Jackson's kind of uh, expounding on that oppression in the NFL and how they exploit their labor and how um, it is just crazy to think about. And so many of these systems, it's the white, older white male in these positions of power and the young uh, person of color um, the, doing the labor. And um, another thing I think about too is just um, when we talk about culture and um, I challenge my students to think about when you're watching a football game or you're watching any kind of sport, listen to how the announcers refer to players of color versus white players, right? The, the white players are smart and if they're quick, they're, you know, they're agility, they have all this agility um, and uh, like the, the way they talk about white players versus African-American players is just unbelievable. It's, it's, they attribute the physical abilities to the, to the African-American players or the black players. And it's all the smarts and the minds uh, for the, the, for the white players. And so even that just continues to, you know, kind of exploit these, these differences and this kind of a plantation slave owner mentality that happens in sports. And so um, I, there's, I mean, I, we could talk about this all day because there's just so much, there's so much great in sport. There's so much in sport too that kind of can just under this guise of like sportsmanship and um, competition that just recreates these systems of of oppression and, and inequality. And uh, John, we can do, I'm sure we'll, we, we're gonna have to do an all day chat or podcast about this kind of stuff because there's so much there. Um, and then, you know, on, on the women's side too as well, like the, the way that, you know, women right now with COVID and like the expectations of athletes coming back to campus and doing workouts and the safety issues, like, um, how, how does that play into all, all this as well, I think, is um, some really interesting questions. I just saw this morning that Morehouse College was canceling all their, all their sports, um, and it makes me wonder, um, you know, really what's, what's going to happen and how different schools are going to, uh, going to take this. Tennessee is, um, our budget today came out with fans still in the stands for football games. I, I think that's crazy, <laughs> to be honest. I don't think that's gonna happen. Uh, so uh, it's um, a lot of, so much of it is a lot of power dynamics and tied to that is often race. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's wild. There's, um, but I think there is, a lot for us to do, especially over this Independence Day holiday. Um, I challenge you to look at um, the Declaration of Independence. And while it promises life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, um, it also talks about, um, it calls uh, Native Americans merciless Indian savages. Um, it refers to Native, it, others, Native Americans, they're, they're not a part of that um, pursuit of happiness, apparently. And, um, 
it's it's kind of an interesting because it's um, a holiday we've a lot of tribes have taken and made their own um, having powwows and things like that and the Navajo especially a lot of people don't realize but Native Americans by percentage of people make up a huge number of people who are in our armed forces and military services and uh, the Navajo code talkers for one and uh, they are very proud to protect and um, defend our country after the country, what, what's gone on in, in our country. And so um, it doesn't always have to be, like I said, it's not about revenge, like John said earlier. It's about how do we live together more in harmony and more making sure that everyone can start at the same point of the finish of the starting line, that we're not starting years and years behind each other. Yeah. Like yeah. To back into the back to the recruiting topic. Yeah. Uh, my perspective on that a little bit, some insight. Uh, you know, kind of looking back, why I came to Linfield. And I, you think about that, uh, Coach Rushman, uh, the head coach at the time, came, he came to Hawaii. And Linfield traditionally has recruited Hawaii and done a pretty good job with the Hawaii students. But Coach Rushman, I believe, had a pretty good understanding of the Hawaiian culture, the Polynesians families and have good relationship with a lot of the coaches. So I think that's important too as recruiters to understand the cultures, the families, developing relationships with the people of that are different and understanding that. And then I look back, I came to Linfield too that there are people like me at Linfield. There are other Hawaii kids that I can relate to. And then I look at the, the coaching staff. We had coaches that were from Hawaii. So someone that could relate to, to me as well. So I think there's a lot of power in having some head coach that understands different cultures and respects different cultures, builds great relationships with people from different makes of, from the different walks of life. I think that's important too. Because in Hawaii culture, if you, if you don't understand how the parents are and how they think, and you don't build that relationship, it, it, it's a little bit more challenging. And then I know that kids feel more comfortable going to places where there's people like me that I can relate to. And then, of course, if I have issues or problems, I can, I can go to a coach or talk to someone that understands how I'm feeling, what I'm struggling with, or if I need help with something. Because a lot of times it's a lot more easy, easier to approach someone who is like you. So I think that's important in recruiting as well. And I'll add, this is Jane, um, I'll, I'll add just as a white woman trying to navigate this and, and understand where I can um, contribute and where I can amplify the voices of black friends and, and uh, friends of color. Um, I, I ask myself, and so I invite other white people on the call to, to ask, what do we have to lose by admitting implicit bias? knowing that as fish in this fishbowl, we've been breathing this water for a while. So what do we have to lose by looking every day to find out how we've internalized some of this, this, this messaging, this uh, supremacy that we meet, didn't form, but haven't dismantled. And can we give ourselves, as John Willis has said before, can we give ourselves proximity to those people that we care about who have a very different reality? because of the color of their skin. And, and when we build that proximity, can we act on their behalf? And, and what can we do? So I think for me, that's a good, um, mentally that's a good place to come from because it allows me the freedom to be, be in learning mode, to be humble, to not have to have answers, but just be willing to investigate and not to um, feel like I have to own all the wrongs of the world, <laughs> but that I can, take action instead of being passive I can start to take action to correct some things and so um, for me that's a helpful place to start from in being an ally and I and so I thought I'd just share that that's that is something that I'm happy to talk with with any other white people about too <laughs> if you're concerned about this piece or feel like it's it's hard to dive in or acknowledge bias um, I'm happy to talk about that more too but that's that's where I come in from Thank you. I, I actually want to respond a little bit to what Kenna just posted. 
um, because she has some very, very big questions. And the reality of it is that I have found, and, and others might want to speak to this, is that when we start that big, it's almost overwhelming. Uh, it, it's not knowing what to do. So, uh, you know, the reality is that um, none of us can do everything, but everyone can do something. And so you're going to have to make a decision, Kenna, about what it is you want to do with this fine education and the fine experience that you're getting at Linfield University. Uh, you are going to have to decide where you want to play uh, in that, um, that, that you, you have to believe, in, because it's true, that you can make a difference. Now, you may not be able to make a difference on every single issue, but if the Flint water crisis is important to you or oil pipelines on indigenous lands, then I would encourage you to join with groups that are doing those things, because there are already people who are addressing all the issues in which you wrote about. Uh, and then if you can find people, because all of us think that we have to reinvent the wheel all the time. We don't. Uh, just just uh, begin to connect with those organizations and lend your voice, time, energy. And uh, yes, sometimes if you're in a position, even your money, uh, to causes that support the things that interest you. Kenna, does that make any sense to you, Kenna? And I want to hear your voice. I know you've been typing it, but just tell me, does that make sense to you? Or is there a, a deeper yearning that you're, that you're looking for there? No, it does. I was just wondering just like if there was any, starting with a broader question, just to hear if there was anything in particular any of you guys had in yeah. like about it. So, so let, let, and let me give you an example, uh, Kenna, because I, I realize, uh, because I'm impacted by this, and then after a very, very, very powerful conversation with my son, uh, who remembered far more than I thought he would about us growing up in, in the car stops that we endured by police, uh, and the questions that we got asked, not just for driver's license, uh, uh, and registration about the question about do you own this car and various other things because the type of car that it was and 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 I and I look at this and and so what I have decided to throw myself into wholeheartedly, Kenna, is how do we build dialogue with police and communities? And so so right now, you know, so like three days ago, I was on the phone with Chief Scales about how do we facilitate dialogue. I mean, it's what I'm doing in Virginia. Is is and, and, and let me be clear, you know, there are going to be people who criticize you. I got criticized because I posted a picture of me and a police officer who happens to be the son of a person who works here, uh, Tim Simmons, and people are like, oh, how can you talk to the police? Because I believe that's how we change. Uh, and so, um, I, I, you know, and so it was, it was uplifting for me to hear Chief Scales, and I don't think I'm talking out of school, approach me about, you know, well, what do you think about this defunding of the police? What does that mean to you and how does that play out? Uh, and, and I tell you what, Ken, having my voice was important because the simple question that I asked him when he was talking about all these policies, and I said, well, let me just ask you a simple question, Chief, is how many people that are making these decisions look like me or they impact the population? He says, Miles, none of them. I said, well, that's where you got to start. I said, you know, you're, make, you're making decisions about people and you don't have any of those people who are impacted by those decisions in the room. And so, so I just want to encourage you and others, uh, uh, kind of your generation, is to, to find those groups that are doing those things and organize and, and make a difference and, 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 uh, and invest yourself so that you know what those issues are and support one another. Does that make sense to you, Kenna? Yes, yes, it did. <laughs> Uh, can I just take a second to brag on Kenna? She uh, she came to me when I first started, and she's a sport management student. She's worked with athletics. She's worked with Trailblazers. She's gonna me and her collaborating to do some research on the impact of COVID on Northwestern Conference athletes. Um, but she has already done so much. And Kenna, I just have to remind you, like you got. A plenty to go. Like you just gotta stay motivated. I already can see like you're doing, you've done so much just in this year that I've gotten to know you and I'm just so proud of you. And I think you're gonna, um, the fact that you're even asking the questions you ask um, says a lot and means a lot. And you're gonna, um, I think like uh, President Davis says, just finding those spots where you can really, really have an impact and really impact others. And 
um, something that Coach uh, Hire kind of made me think about, I kind of want to go circle back to is that, um, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of talk about adding diversity and inclusion officers, um, a lot of athletic departments are adding diversity and inclusion committees. Um, I, I get an email from higher inside higher ed about job postings and one is specifically diversity and um, uh, inclusion. You sh that one was 10 page long, long this last time I got it. It was just blown up. And I think that rush to like try to implement these systems can um, sometimes um, be a little hasty and tokenize people of color and put people of color in these positions where they um, really aren't don't have power don't have money or resources to do the work that's necessary and um, so I think about when we think about you know we can recruit diversely but if they come to Linfield and they don't feel comfortable, like Coach Hire said, like if they don't, if they come to Linfield and they don't feel comfortable, they're not going to stay. Um, so we can't have diversity without inclusion first. We have to have an inclusive environment where people feel comfortable um, to have that diversity. And so um, I think that um, is going to be really, um, really important for us to think about moving forward. But um, that was, I'm glad Coach Hire mentioned that because I think it is um, really important to think about like um, the things that we do, we have to be, make sure we're setting everyone up for, for that success. Um, I think, I uh, think we, in maybe we close into to wrapping up. Um, uh, did a, Coach Willis, uh, Coach Gibbler, Coach Hire. I want to make sure anyone, not, honestly, uh, Jane. I have a, uh, I have one last thing to add, and it'll speak to Kenneth's last question. Um, I would encourage you to, like you've already highlighted a couple of issues there. I would encourage you to research those issues and find people on both sides of them. So uh, just to share a personal thing that I'm doing, um, I do have a problem with how, I have a problem with people who look like me with their interactions with the police, uh, whether it's ended up, unfortunately, losing your life. Uh, There's a gentleman video posted two days ago where a gentleman got body slammed, got his arm broken, who was waiting on money for a Western Union. Um, just kind of the harassment and the interaction. Um, I have a problem with that. So there are police officers that I'm speaking to. Uh, I've gone on four ride-alongs um, since this, this happened. And what, what is coming from this is um, I'm finding out what's more important to myself. And uh, don't be surprised if, if I end up founding a new political party, just because I'm tired of settling for the lesser of two evils, you know, just to be honest with you. So um, I do have a problem with police brutality and the use of force, but my way of approaching it is I'm talking to other officers as well. You know, because there are criminals, there are people who break the law, right? Um, so like one of the things that I've learned from my conversation is the use of jujitsu training. Okay, so I've had um, several officers that I've spoken with have told me how they feel as though if they had more jujitsu training, then we would not have nearly as many deaths. Okay, because they'd be able to put somebody in a hold or apprehend someone and they'd be able to get handcuffs on them. But they were also telling me about the lack of training, right? So I was talking to a guy, my, a friend of mine, who's a Florida Highway Patrolman. And he said they had two jujitsu classes for the year. They were one hour long each, you know? And, and so, um, you know, he, he was saying how you're giving deadly weapons or tools to a person who isn't required to have as much training, right? So like he compared it to an anesthesiologist. So somebody who can put you to sleep, look at the amount of training and the amount of schooling they have to go through to be an anesthesiologist. And it's nowhere near that to be a police officer. Um, another thing that has come up in one of my conversations is maybe having in a police officer's clip on their gun, the first four bullets actually be rubber bullets and not normal bullets. Um, so that if they are shooting somebody, maybe this person doesn't die because they got hit with two rubber bullets. 
instead. So, but anyway, so I'm, I'm actively, I'm like Dr. Davis. Um, I'm, I'm more about the solution, right? I'm working on what we can do to make it better and understanding the system in which we live in, what ways do we have to go about it, right? Like, how do we have to go about it? Like Dr. David said earlier, the most patriotic thing you can do is vote, right? Well, what information do you know about who's running for city council or who's going to be the tax collector or what information do you know about the people who are running for office? Like you talked about um, the school to prison pipeline. I'm guilty of being from Florida where when the housing market crashed, the prison industry boomed, right? And so like right now, I feel as though the cycle is set up for more kids to go to prison. Why? Because in my hometown, they spent 200 million more dollars on law enforcement than they did on education. So over a 10 year period, now look at that generation of kids. It's almost like it's a waiting game, right? Like how long until they come here? So um, that would be my encouragement to you. Uh, so so uh, uh, Coach, Coach Willis, I want to uh, yes, tell you to be on the lookout for a pizza and politics being sponsored by Professor uh, Cottrell, Patrick Cottrell, uh, we've connected with uh, people who are organizing third parties and having the very conversation you're talking about. Um, I, I do want to share some information because I do have to jump off and this is hot off the press. Matter of fact, it's not on the press yet, uh, but I want to share with you. Uh, so uh, there are two relevant developments that you need to know. And I'm going to give you far more information than you need to address the specific question. But this is really interesting because what has just happened in Washington state, I suspect is gonna to come to Oregon uh, soon. The, the, the governor in Washington has exempted the 50 colleges and universities in Washington state from the state opening and reopening guidelines. Are you processing that? Mm. Uh, you, you process that for a second, just take that in. Which so, so then each institution has to make decisions consistent with its type of institution. Stay with me. Uh, and so what the decision has been made at the conference level, because there's some things that decide, some things that are not decided, and I'll give you an answer to that also, uh, is that as of now, uh, we are going forward with an in-conference season uh, there was a proposal, you talked to Gary about this, there was a particular proposal for football and a particular proposal for volleyball that has been approved. And so Gary can give you all the details about what that looks like. There was also conversation related to strategic going forward on sports, such as if you decide or something happens that we can't play football uh, or volleyball or soccer. What about golf or cross country? Uh, and so, so there is, and I mentioned the first thing first because what this begins to do is say, no one size fits all. We have to look at what's happening within the context of the sport and within the context of the institution. Um, what is not decided, uh, because there's a split, uh, particularly among the Oregon, the, the simplest way is between the Oregon and the Washington contingent, is that uh, under the heck, because you know it's interesting because people, and there's even information out there now that you know about what, whether we're following CDC guidance or whatever, the, the authoritative body for higher education in Oregon is the HEC, okay? And HEC has a set of guidelines about what it is that we should do. And so what the HEC has said is that colleges and universities should not be allowing people on campus. It should only be open for essential campus business. And so as of now, there is not a clear interpretation as to whether that means fans. So that's what's being wrestled with. And so I can, I can even share with you some of the context of that conversation 
uh, because it's relevant to a number of other things, which is, okay, we have athletics and we have gatherings. Do the students get to attend? With proper social distancing, because you know, we already do have the science, and the science says that being outside helps reduce transmission. The science also says that um, social distancing helps reduce transmissions. The science also says that wearing a face mask helps reduce transmissions. And so you could make a case that if people are outside wearing face masks and properly social distancing, they should be allowed to attend. Uh, but this is not the issue that has been resolved and there's consideration uh, that is being given to those issues. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, so again, I keep emphasizing this, as of today, uh, there are plans to have an athletic season uh, going forward. What that will look like, uh, we have clarification on from a season perspective, and it has to do with home games and away games. And I'm not going to bore you for all the details. Uh, you know, that, that's Gary's job uh, to share the information about what happens in athletics. But for those who are generally concerned, what I will tell you is um, Linfield is going to be spotlighted in a lot of this. I'll just put this this way, because I will tell you that I don't know. Uh, I'm assuming that this audience is a relatively sophisticated sports audience, so you know what's happening in Orlando. Do I need to explain anything more about that to anybody if there is? Just speak up. I'm assuming that everybody knows. I don't need to explain. Okay, everybody knows what that is. That's what's going to happen with Linfield, is that volleyball will be do a round robin at Linfield. Uh, and then it'll happen in reverse for football. So there will not be football games on the campus of Linfield at the same time that there are volleyball games to reduce uh, locker room and various other transmission things. So, so these are the things that are happening. Uh, and, and it got triggered, uh, actually, Natalie, when you said doing research on NWS, uh, the Northwest Conference af af athletes. Um, uh, it was interesting being in those conversations and listening to that and then hearing you saying that. So that's the latest and the greatest. There'll be an announcement that comes out Monday. So don't go putting out press releases. Don't go sending out a bunch of email. I don't want to get in too much trouble. I, it wasn't that I was told to keep it in confidence. But I think, you know, I think for those of you who took time on a Friday afternoon to sit here and engage in this important conversation, that shows a high level of commitment on your part. And so my gift to you is to give you secret information that nobody else will get <laughs> until Monday. So it's the least I can do uh, uh, in response to what it is you're doing. Any questions for me about any of this? And I'm done. Miles, just one clarification. The, the volleyball proposal was a volleyball soccer uh, proposal. Yes. Correct. Is, yes. Right. Yeah. And so, so it'll be done. Uh, we will, we will, we will be the Disney World, right? To to limit spread, right? And so we will be there. Yes, that that that's what that that was approved. The proposal was approved. To let you know that that was coming in, uh, and that's what's being addressed. So there's uh, going to be the whole conference at Linfield. Uh, so the the teams that come in and are playing, they all play at Linfield, um, and oh. so we we will be, you know, it'll be home home. And so when football goes, it'll be a series games. It'll be a bunch of uh, people at one location playing that one event. Uh, it'll be like hosting, um, it'll be like hosting a, a champions tournament at our campus. Uh, and so and 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 Jane, you know, Natalie, uh, there there is a, a deep dive into matchings and pairings uh, to ensure equities because you don't want to have a, you know, a Linfield powerhouse plan, a not so great powerhouse. And so uh, to make sure it's a competition. Uh, and then, and I'll tell you a question that I asked, which I'm hoping I was channeling some of you, was how do we really treat the season in case it's interrupted, in case it was happening, that we will treat the fall season the same way we treated the spring season, which is that if it gets canceled, there's no champion, there's no things. It just it just goes in as a as as athletics interrupt us uh, into the season. And, but but and also I want to share again because it's important for us to hear is that part of this was due about how you spread out 
what was that requirement that we heard at the conference, Gary, about uh, was it athletic trainers or something? Mm -hmm. and so, so, so having this like this assures that there are a sufficient number of athletic trainers available according to the new NC AA regulations in regards to the number of athletic trainers that have to be available to an institution. That's what it was athletic trainers, wasn't it, Gary? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, and just a little bit more detail, just to make it a little bit more clear for you, is that, for example, if we play uh, Pacific in volleyball and soccer, and we're the host, then they will come here, and it's to limit the exposure outside of, outside of that, if that makes sense. Uh, football will never be at the same venue as volleyball and soccer to try to decrease the likelihood of transmission of anything, but also to make it so that it's not too onerous on the athletic training staffs, which is part of what Miles was just getting at. So we thought through this quite a bit to try to figure out how to decrease the likelihood of, of letting this blow up on us. So, so yeah. I just and have I to say, I do, not, uh, I do not regret being in those positions that you guys are in right now. And no, having to have those conversations. <laughs> that, that is, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, but, but I, I will tell you um, that the overarching conference, so first of all, I, I have to commend my fellow presidents and, and our institutions, and I will tell you what the focus is. The focus is on the student experience. They get it and say, you know, look, you know, we're all residential campuses. We have to provide a student experience. I, I understand, you know, that there are risks, but we're looking at our circumstances within the context. You know, there are things that we're looking at, like batch testing and various other things that will help mitigate it. But we're very clear that it's about the student experience. And quite frankly, Natalie, one of the things that I've been on the stump about is that I'm, I'm tired of the conversation about online education because of what we provide is much more than education. We are a social service agency. We often provide the only healthcare students have, the mental access to services that students have. Hell, we often provide the only uh, internet access that they have in the three meals a day in the rooms. We all do that. So just saying that education is online isn't meeting the needs of Linfield or Whitman or Whitworth or Lewis and Clark or George Fox or uh, one of Pacific uh, students is not meeting what their needs are about why they come and what they get from my institution. Uh, it's much more than that. And athletics is a part of that. So if I can, if I can chip in just a little bit here, I haven't really said much of anything. Part of that is because I'm about to be a 60 year old white male in the US. July 4th is my birthday. And as I was coming into this conversation, uh, and most of you know me super well, you know me well enough to know that I couldn't give a rat's rumpus about the color of somebody's skin or what church they go to or don't go to or whatever. I care deeply about humans. And it's really fantastic to see what is happening with this as one of the formats, I'm very, very happy to be supportive of this and every other initiative that we come up with in athletics that actually brings us together and not put any kind of thing between us. When we initiated all of the all-in stuff, all-in doesn't, it's not just about sports and it's not just about coming into our venue and competing against a, a football team or a basketball team or whatever. It is truly about bringing people together towards a common goal. Hmm, that sounds awfully familiar to me. It sounds exactly like where we should be with our country. And it is where we will go. I am sorry for the idiots in the US. I am, I'm deeply sorry. I'm sorry for the things in the past. I, I don't have any part of that, but unfortunately I get associated with that because of, of um, the color of my skin and my age and, and whatnot. And, you know, but my, my personal goal is to continue on a path of all in and driving people closer together, not letting them drive each other apart. So I'll leave it at that all in and thank you all for what you're doing. Let's keep it up. That was a great note to end on, Gary.
Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Everyone, uh, everybody take care. care. Yeah, take care of yourselves. Wear your masks. Yeah. Thanks, right, everyone. Guys. Okay.